All right, uh, so I'm gonna give a quick introduction uh, to our speaker today. So, so we're very pleased to have uh, Professor Howard Wiseman uh, give us our Institute for Quantum Studies seminar this week. Uh, Howard is in fact a member of our Institute here at the Ch uh, Institute for Quantum Studies at Chapman University. Uh, so ha Howard started out his life uh, his, for his PhD in physics at the University of Queensland, working on quantum trajectories and feedback uh, with Gerald Milburn. Uh, and then he went on to do some further work at the University of Queensland as a postdoc and a research fellow, and then uh, came back to uh, Australia to uh, Griffiths University, um, uh, where he's, at, uh, he's been there since uh, 2000. And uh, now as a full professor there at the Center for Quantum Dynamics. Okay, so Howard is a, has many different awards throughout his career. I'll mention he's a fellow of the American Physical Society as well as the Optical uh, the, the Optical Society of America, which is now Optica. Yeah. Uh, he's an honorary fellow at the University, honorary professor at the University of Queensland, uh, founding faculty member at the John Bell Institute uh, for the Foundations of Physics and uh, general all-around quantum uh, superhero. So we're, we're very pleased to have Howard uh, talk to us today uh, about his newest work, telling us about possible friends that we might have in a quantum computer. So Howard, please can, please take the reins. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Andrew. That's, uh, that's very kind. I, I'll, I'll just clarify, yeah, it was uh, University of Auckland I spent some time with after my PhD before coming back to Australia. Yep. <clears throat> Um, so yes, um, so the topic today, uh, as, as Andrew said, uh, can a qubit be your friend? Uh, the subtitle is why experimental metaphysics needs a quantum computer. So, uh, so this is why uh, this work is supported by the Australian Research Council Center for Quantum Computation and Communication Technology, which is an Australia-wide um, center of excellence. Um, and I guess because of the uh, experimental metaphysics is why it's supported by the also by the Foundational Questions Institute. Um, and yes, I'm at Griffith University, which is a multi campus university, but uh, I'm in the uh, Brisbane, one of the Brisbane campuses, um, and which is just here on this continent. Uh, <clears throat> shown here. Okay, so uh, yeah, this this work is by no means just mine. And so I'll be talking about so I'm going to begin by talking about what was in this, well, when I get to the original work, what was in uh, this paper from 2020. Uh, and so almost all the authors here are also uh, Griffith authors. Um, and, and it actually alternates uh, experiment theory, experiment theory, experiment theory, um, <clears throat> all the way down. So yes, yeah, so I'll also br very briefly talk about an experiment uh, unless people have questions and then I can talk in more detail about that. Um, the exception is uh, Yong Cheng Lang, who's a theorist at National Cheng Cook University, uh, Taiwan. Uh, but then in the latter part of the talk, I wanna talk about, um, Another paper, which is still in preparation, it's one of these papers that, uh, yeah, I've been giving this talk for so long and saying, <laughs> next time I give this talk, this will actually be on the archive. And no, it, it, it's, it's still not, uh, but it's getting closer. Um, and this is, uh, do you see this little pop-up window? Uh, that's annoying. Oh, well. Yes, we do. <laughs> uh, I guess there's, yeah. Oh, well, that, that's just gonna happen then, sorry. Um, uh, right, yeah, so this is work also with Eric Cavalcanti, who I should say was uh, the other lead uh, theorist on this nature physics paper, uh, and also with our colleague Eleanor Riafel at uh, NASA, uh, NASA Ames in San Francisco. Okay, um, <clears throat> so without further ado, then I'll go on with the talk. And so this is, this is the structure. I'm gonna begin with an introduction, um, which is more or less the motivation and historical background. Uh, the second, which will deal with uh, what was in the nature physics paper. And then the third part, which is what is in this new in preparation paper, <clears throat> and then the conclusion. 
so um, yeah, so to explain. Right, so one, one motivation for this work is that uh, we found a novel customer for a quantum computer, uh, and that is philosophers wanting to advance experimental metaphysics, which I'm sure you all agree is a, is a, a huge uh, global market that's gonna be very important uh, to the quantum computer industry. Um, <clears throat> okay, so probably everybody in this uh, attending here knows what, what metaphysics is. Um, just a philosophy that deals with the most fundamental things um, in, in, yeah, that'll do. Um, and, and probably most of you also know what experimental metaphysics is, but just in case not, uh, it's a phrase that was coined by philosopher Abner Shimini, uh, actually in this, uh, this book from 1987, uh, Philosophical Consequences of Quantum Theory. <clears throat> and yeah, it's a, it's a term that's been used a little bit since then, in particular in this uh, conference, for example, from 2017, 30 years on from this book, um, it was actually the title of the conference, and, uh, and Eric Cavalcanti was one of the uh, participants, one of the yeah, keynote uh, participants in, in that conference, uh, although not talking about the work that we're talking about here, because this was in 2017. Um, so you'll see that the subtitle of this 1987 book is Reflections on Bell's Theorem, uh, which tells you that, yes, in 1987, um, yeah, that, that was all, that was the theorem that, that people were talking about. Uh, and, and one of the exciting things in Quantum Foundations is that we have really moved on in the last 30 plus years, and, and now there's a, a lot more uh, theorems and things that people are talking about, uh, including some of experimental metaphysics, as, as I'll explain. But nevertheless, um, for understanding what I want to talk about, Bell's theorem is still the foundational. Uh, it's, so it's important to understand a particular way of presenting Bell's theorem, which I'm going to do, will help to understand our new theorem. Okay, but to begin, let's just look at the way Bell presented it back in 1964. Uh, so there's the, the title of the paper. <clears throat> and this is from the conclusion. Uh, I think it's actually a very clear statement of what he showed in 1964. Uh, the statistical predictions of quantum mechanics are incompatible with separable predetermination. And then he goes on to clarify what he means by that phrase, separable predetermination, but in the negative, in the sense of well, what happens if, if, you know, if it's incompatible with that, what does that mean? Uh, so that means that if we do have predetermination, in other words, in any theory in which parameters determine the results of individual measurements, that's what the predetermination means, then it must be that the separability is violated. So, and what he means by that is there must be a mechanism whereby the setting of one measurement device can influence the reading of another instrument, however remote. <clears throat> okay, now the reason I put this part in brown and the rest in black is, is that this part is not a, uh, a metaphysical assumption, okay? The statistical predictions of quantum mechanics is a uh, uh, predictions that can be tested in the laboratory. So in 1964, they had not been tested in the laboratory. I mean, in the regime, in you know, the particular experiment that Bell was talking about, these things had not been tested, but nevertheless, it was a prediction of the best theory which we had of the world, which was quantum mechanics. And, and it's just something, well, you just go in the laboratory and do it. Of course, it turned out to be uh, very challenging to because people kept finding loopholes and, and you know, it was ugly, arguably it took 50 years um, to get to the point where, where like everyone more or less agreed that, that we closed all of those. And we could say that, um, yeah, that, that we don't need any more to talk about uh, the statistical predictions of quantum mechanics. We can just say the results of experiments. Okay, so, so again, this, this in brown to represent that this is just empirical. Um, so we can say uh, Bell experiments rule out certain metaphysical assumptions. Now, uh, I want to be more careful and choose different, uh, differently worded assumptions from what Bell did in 1964. Again, there's been a tremendous amount of work uh, in the intervening time on making very precise what the assumptions are. Uh, and this is a particular set that um, yeah, that is the way that I want to do it. It's quite close to uh, what Bell did 
did. So we still, in fact, have predetermination, um, but we, instead of talking about, you know, separable or non-separability or something like that, uh, I want to use this concept of local agency. So let's start with that. Um, so here's, this is uh, a definition of this concept. Um, any intervention X, so that's, that's like, you know, this is, corresponds to the setting of a measurement device, basically. Uh, any, intervention, any intervention X made in a manner appropriate, uh, appropriate for randomized experimental trials of a given phenomenon is uncorrelated with any set of physical events. So this is a bit broader than what Bell was talking about. Um, uncorrelated with any set of physical events that are relevant to the phenomenon and outside X's future light cone. So it's basically saying that, yeah, um, if you're investigating given a phenomenon and you choose to your settings in, a, in an appropriate randomized uh, way, uh, then the only physical events that are correlated, the only relevant physical events that are correlated are in the future light kind of X. And I guess the way I just stated there is not completely technically equivalent to what I just what the way it's written there so if you want to know exactly what the definition is it's it's what written there but but that's hopefully to give you an idea about what it's saying okay so hopefully there's a reasonably intuitive idea it, it's trying to capture the idea that influences can't travel faster than light okay that would be the that would be the uh the short version of it but i did want to be careful um <clears throat> if we're going to talk about theorems we want to be uh, careful in the way we, we uh, state it. Okay, so it is important to note that this is not the same as local causality, which I'm not going to define because it's not going to come up in any of the theorems here. But for those who know about that, it's not the same as that. It's also not the same, quite the same as locality, which is what a lot of people say, you know, that was Bell's assumption in 1964, which is, yeah, probably... Um, reasonable, although he didn't stick to exactly that terminology. Um, the reason in particular that it's stronger than locality is that it also includes in it uh, the idea of ruling out superdeterminism. So if we make this assumption, we don't have to worry about the idea that there could be a common cause between our interventions and other things which are happening in the experiment, some sort of conspiracy where we're we're always going to, you know, choose a particular intervention in a particular experiment because there's these correlations there. So it, it, it rules that out. Okay, so if that's going to be an important concept, which goes through the whole talk. So I felt it was worth spending a little bit of time. Okay, second uh, assumption uh, is also, yeah, going to be important. And so this is one that really doesn't get mentioned very often when people talk about um, Bell's theorem, but it is an implicit assumption there. Um, so I'm going to call it absoluteness of observation. Uh, an observation is a real single physical event and not relative to anything or anyone. <clears throat> so you might ask, well, okay, if you were naive, you might ask, well, what on earth does that mean? How could an event be relative? But if, um, if you, uh, yeah, if you studied quantum interpretations like many worlds interpretation or cubism, then you would know that there are people who, um, well, there are, there are these interpretations which deny that this is true, okay, which would say that when an observation happens, that's not just something we can talk about in an absolute sense that the observation happened. No, we might say, oh, well, this is an observation in this world, but in another world, I observed something else, right? or that this is an observation for me, but for you, who, who knows, right? Okay. Um, okay, and then the last one, predetermination, exactly the same word that Bell used in, in 1964. Um, I think I, it, it turns out it's surprisingly difficult to give that a, a rigorous definition that actually works in the proof of Bell's theorem. Um, so I don't think I actually want to read through all of this um, because, yeah, it's the least... Uh, intuitive of all of these uh, and it's the one that we're not going to actually keep so um, so just be aware that there is a way to to define predetermination in a, in a sufficiently rigorous way to derive Bell's theorem um, but when you do that you also see like oh my god why do we have this assumption this one is clearly the one that we want to get rid of but we do need 
for Bell's theorem, uh, if, we, if we base it on local agency as our sort of uh, notion of locality, then we do need definitely something like predetermination. Uh, there, are other, there are other assumptions as well, but we need something which plays this role. Okay, so, so the idea of how that works is that we, um, uh, yeah, how do we use these? I think I've changed the order here. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> so this is a space time diagram. Probably everyone's familiar with this. I have Alice's lab over here uh, and Bob's lab over here because time is going upwards. Um, Alice has a setting X and gets outcome A and Bob Y and B. Uh, and then there's some space like hypersurface before all this uh, on which uh, there may be hidden variables, lambda. There may be things that we don't see in our, we, you know, we can't directly uh, probe um, in our experiment. So we allow for the fact that there may be things like that. And then under the assumption of predetermination, well, then it, what we say is that then uh, that the outcomes are predetermined given these hidden variables. Okay, so obviously, then we do have to postulate they exist because in in standard quantum theory, we do not have predetermination. It's not the fact that if you know everything in the past and you know what the setting choices are, that you know what the outcomes are going to be. But that's what predetermination means. Uh, yep. Okay. Uh, and then the assumption of local agency then says that the probability. So to take for example, Alice's outcome is going to say that the probability of Alice's outcome. Uh, condition on these lambdas and on x and on y, in fact, does not depend on y. Okay, so I can drop the dependence on y uh, because this choice y is not in the past light cone of this outcome a. And so the local agency says there's no way that it could influence it essentially. And so, yeah, we drop that there. And then, as I said, it also implies um, well, the same assumption of local agency that the probability of these. Uh, hidden variables has to be independent of the setting choices x and y. Okay, so that's the way that it also um, rules out having to worry about super determinism in, in the theory. Okay, so we take these um, constraints. Oh, you might wonder, okay, but what part did you know this assumption, absoluteness of observations, where what where is it playing any role in this theorem? Uh, and the answer is well, just the fact of writing down a probability distribution like this uh, presumes that we are talking about single outcomes in a single world, so that there exists a probability distribution for these things. These are events in the same world. Um, and so it, it makes sense to write down a joint probability distribution for these things. <clears throat> Okay, but then the, these assumptions here imply constraints on these empirical probabilities. That's an important point, uh, is that because this does not involve lambda anymore. So I, I average over lambda, I get, uh, according to the theory, I get these uh, some constraints on the what I would actually be able to observe, the correlations involving X, Y, A, and B. Uh, and then what we know is that uh, experiments actually violate those constraints. And so that's what Bell's theorem is. Okay, so yeah, that took a while, but but let's keep going. All right, so around about um, the same time that Bell was writing, just slightly earlier, this is the other historical element that goes into this whole discussion. Uh, Wigner was making some famous uh, musings on the quantum measurement problem. Um, so it's not a theorem in the same way as Bell's theorem by any means, um, but it definitely, yeah, it was uh, historically important. Um, so I think it's worth, again, like actually looking quoting from Wigner's 1961 paper. Uh, so he says, uh, it's natural to ask about the situation if one does not make an observation oneself, that is on a quantum system, uh, but lets someone else carry it out. What is the wave function if my friend, and this is the famous sentence where the word friend enters, Wigner's friend enters into history. If my friend looked at the quantum object, uh, the answer is that one could only attribute the wave function to the joint system of friend plus object uh, like this. Okay, so this is an entangled state involving, um, yeah, I kind of actually, I'm not sure which one is which. Let's say that's the object and that one's the friend. Okay, um, so if you start with the superposition for in, in the ba measurement basis of the object, then you end up with the superposition, an entangled superposition, including the friend. 
Uh, and he says this follows from the linearity of Schrodinger's equation. Uh, but then this appears absurd because it implies that my friend was in a state of suspended animation, in other words, in this superposition, uh, before he answered my question about what he saw. So the idea is you ask your question, what did, he, what did you see? And the friend uh, gives an answer. And then according to quantum theory, well, then you collapse to either this branch or this branch of the superposition. But according to quantum theory, before you ask the question, your friend had no definite um, uh, well, yeah, uh, yeah, was in this state of suspended animation, not having seen one or the other uh, of these, these outcomes. So it's basically very much like Schrodinger's cap, but putting a human observer uh, in that place to make it even more acute. Okay, so, so then what did Wigner conclude from that? Um, we said it follows that Schrodinger's equation cannot be linear, okay? So he's saying it, this is absurd. Uh, so therefore, something is wrong in the assumptions, uh, and what he concluded was that it's Schrodinger's equation cannot be linear. Okay, if it is accepted that my friend has the same types of impressions and sensations as I. Okay, so, so what he's saying is, well, I know I'm not in a superposition, so it would be ridiculous to think that my friend is uh, if they uh, have the same type of impressions and sensations as I do, uh, and and therefore there must be something wrong with this equation. Okay, so it, so it's just a, it's not a it's not a theorem as I said, it's just a, a sort of argument, um, but yes, it's been uh, very influential over the years. Okay, so moving on to to the new theorem. So in particular, like it's become um, very um, much discussed again in the last few years because of the idea of combining the like Wigner's friend and some sort of non-locality. So there are a number of uh, groups who've, who've done work on this. I'm just going to stick to the one that's relevant to uh, our work uh, as a forerunner. And that was this paper by Chasla Bruckner, uh, which he called a no-go theorem for observer independent facts. So the, the basic idea is, yeah, to incorporate Wigner's friends into a Bell experiment. Uh, and with the hope, it, well, it, it seems, uh, to get rid of that predetermination assumption, that the one that, that really seems like the one that we should get rid of, the, the not very natural one, the one that's not satisfied by quantum theory, et cetera, um, by making the friend's observations play the role of the hidden variables. Okay, that's, that's the intuition. Um, but I guess it's important to point out that in, in stating it as a no-go theorem, uh, there's actually an assumption that Unlike what Wigner um, thought, uh, it's not necessarily absurd to think that a friend could be in a superposition. Okay, so in fact, what we're imagining is doing an experiment where we actually do put the friends into a superposition, and it's important that they're in superposition um, in order for the experiment to work, so to speak. Okay, so 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 all credit to Bruckner for that. Um, unfortunately, the way he formulated the, the theorem uh, didn't match the sort of motivations um, because he ended up making assumptions which were just as strong as Bell's assumptions. Uh, and so well, really you just end up proving Bell's theorem by a very elaborate uh, sort of setup. But the good news is that we found a new theorem uh, which didn't do that, which makes much weaker metaphysical assumptions than Bell did. Um, and so, which is actually a stronger theorem than Bell's, and that's what uh, I'll present. Okay, so, so this is the theorem we published in the 2020 paper uh, with the rather uninspiring paper uh, title of a, a strong no-go theorem uh, on the bigness friend paradox. <clears throat> okay, but this is what the strong uh, no-go theorem is, is that is the conjunction of these assumptions is a contradiction. Okay, so first one, local agency, the same as before, short version, any intervention, any intervention X is uncorrelated with any set of relevant physical events outside X's future light cone. Second, absoluteness of observation, same as before, an observation is a real single physical event and not relative to anything or anyone. Uh, and that's it for metaphysical assumptions. So we don't need a third metaphysical assumption. Uh, however, we do need a technological assumption, which we didn't call in this paper, we didn't call superpowers. Um, so I'm sort of jokingly calling that here because people often use the term super observer 
to, to refer to the Vigna uh, who, who's doing an experiment on its friend. Uh, so this assumption is that a super observer can perform arbitrary quantum operations on an observer, a friend, and the observer's environment. Uh, so yeah, so again, just to stress that this is not a metaphysical assumption. Uh, it may be true, it may not be true, and again, it will depend on which Wigner and which friend we're talking about, but in some specific experiment, it's just this has empirical consequences that are either, um, yeah, we can either, we find that it's true or it's not true, uh, basically, uh, to the extent that's necessary for, for the experiment. So it's not really a yeah, I, I want to claim this is not a metaphysical assumption. It has the same status as what Bell wrote in 1964 as the statistical predictions of quantum mechanics. Uh, it's just our best theory, quantum theory, does not say that this is impossible. Um, like arguably it says, yes, in principle, that's possible. Just as in 1964, in principle, it would be possible to do, you know, uh, a, a, bell ex a loophole free bell experiment, but it took 50 years until it was actually possible. Uh, and it may take, as we'll see, 50 years until this is possible. Um, you can judge for yourself as we get later in the talk. Okay. Um, okay, so how does this work? So we imagine we start with two observers, uh, Charlie and Debbie, who are going to share uh, an entangled pair of particles like this. And they're going to make measurements on those particles. No measurement choice here. They just measure the particle in a particular basis. Now, I want to uh, just concentrate on one side now, Charlie. And Alice now is the super observer. Okay, so Alice is playing the role of Vigna. Charlie is playing the role of the friend. <clears throat> if Alice's uh, intervention setting choice, free choice, however you want to call it, is x equal one, uh, then she simply opens the box that Charlie is in and asks, box, asks Charlie what he saw. He answers, she records that as her measurement result A. Okay, so that's if she chooses the first setting for her measurement, right? Um, on the other hand, so this is parallel, this is an alternative. Um, if she doesn't, if she has some other setting, X not equal to one, so if I ran a number for generator, ran a number generator, for example, tells her no, make measurement two or three or whatever. Then she does something different. What she essentially, she presses a button which reverses the evolution in Charlie's lab, including Charlie, uh, so that we go back to the state of Charlie having not made a measurement on his entangled particle, his, his half of the entangled pair. Uh, and then Alice simply, this is one way to think about what happened, uh, simply uh, throws Charlie away and makes her own measurement on the quantum particle, which is no longer entangled with Charlie. Uh, so she brings up her own measurement device, makes measurement, gets a result, and records that as her, as her result A. Okay. So then the, the same thing is happening on Bob's side with Debbie. Uh, exactly the same thing with Y instead of, of X. Um, and yeah, we have some space-time arrangement like this, similar to Bell's theorem. Okay, so what, what do we get from our assumptions? So remember, we only have these two assumptions. So uh, absoluteness of the observed events. Uh, so remember, we, we are saying that Charlie and Debbie really make measurements, C and D, okay, uh, with outcomes C and D. Uh, so absoluteness of observed events means that these, you know, A, B, C, D, all exist in the same world, right? They all just absolutely exist. And even though it could be that we can undo those, those results or you know, erase all memory of those results from the universe at a later time, nevertheless, at the time they were made, these really existed, okay? And so they exist in an absolute sense. That's what the absoluteness assumption means. So that means that, yeah, if I, if I that this probability P, A, B given X, Y, can be written as a marginal of a probability of all four of these events, A, B, C, D, given X, Y. Okay. Uh, and also the way the protocol is set up is that if Alice uh, uses setting one, then A1 is just equal to C. And if Bob uses setting one, then B1 is just equal to D. Because they, yeah, they just open the box and literally ask Charlie or Debbie what they saw. Okay. Um, so that's, that's what we get from absoluteness, essentially. Um, and then local agency is exactly the same before, but with CD, you know, in place of the lambdas. 
Okay, so all of these constraints here. Um, okay, so so for, for ease of talking about it, we will call these assumptions uh, local friendliness. Okay, because it yeah well, for obvious reasons. Um, yeah, so these are two metaphysical assumptions in the conjunction. We're going to call that. All right, uh, and just as with Bell's theorem, uh, these imply constraints on the observable probabilities for Alice and Bob, PAB given XY. Uh, and moreover, what the theorem is, is that these constraints can be violated if the appropriate superpowers exist, okay? And so that it doesn't even have to be perfect. All that we require is that, yeah, if Alice and Bob um, undo Charlie and Debbie's measurements and then make their own measurements, they, the probability distribution in that case is approximately the same as if there had just never been a Charlie and Debbie in the first place. If, if just Alice and Bob had just measured directly onto the entangled particle uh, with no Charlie and Debbie involved at all. Uh, so yeah, this just has to be an approximately equal, just as with Bell's theorem, we don't actually require, as Bell assumed that the statistical predictions of quantum theory, uh, yeah, we don't actually require that. We just require uh, empirical results, which are reasonably close to the empirical, sorry, reasonably close to the statistical predictions of quantum theory. So we're not assuming that quantum theory is correct here. We're just assuming that what we see in the lab is going to be close enough to what quantum theory predicts uh, in, to, to get a violation. So, so that's a really important point that I want to stress. So the, the fact that we're using quantum theory to, to say you know, what we might see in the lab is not assuming that quantum theory is the correct theory. We don't have to, we don't have to assume that. We're just saying, okay, if we get this, then we can violate uh, these these outcomes here. And we have good reason to think that we could get uh, results like this because of quantum theory. But it's just a good reason. It doesn't, it doesn't mean we've assumed quantum theory. It just means that, well, it seems like it would be worthwhile doing the experiment, <laughs> okay, because quantum theory says maybe you'll get this, and that would be very interesting. Okay. So my claim then is that this is a new theorem of experimental metaphysics, okay, because it's just relying on these metaphysical assumptions of absoluteness of observed events and local agency, uh, and says these have empirical consequences, which we could go into the lab and we have reason to think that we would be able to uh, violate them. Okay, and, and that's exactly what we did. We went into the lab and, uh, and did this. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm, this is boom. This is all the technical details behind what we, like, what we actually proved, uh, what we, how we designed the inequality, what we did in the lab and what the results were. Uh, and, and yeah, all of these slides appear individually if people wanna ask about them. Uh, but here, I'm just going to jump straight to the answer that we violated the local friendliness inequality by more than standard 17 standard deviations. So we, we have good evidence of that. Okay, so why am I doing this? Why am I skipping over this? Why wouldn't, yeah, why is this not the end of the story that I would spend um, yeah, a lot of time going through? <clears throat> The reason is that in the lab, uh, each friend was just a single qubit, okay? Because our, our uh, experimental, um, yeah, the experiment, no, I don't have the picture there, but yes, the experimental lab of Jeff Pride, um, it has a lot of capabilities, but they don't actually have superpowers, okay? So, um, so this was just a four qubit experiment, in fact, just two photons. So the, the uh, entangled photons were entangled in polarization, and then we just used the path of each photon as another degree of freedom defining another qubit, which is uh, the friend that measures the polarization degree of freedom of the photon. Okay, uh, and as I said, I won't, I'm not going through the details here. So then, anyway, so this raised the question was, well, can a qubit be a friend? Okay, the, the, the title. Uh, and in our paper, um, I think we were pretty clear that this is, no, not a real friend. Uh, and that's why we call it a microscopic proof of principle version of an experimental test of local friendliness rather than an actual experimental test. And that, yeah, okay. So then that raises the question, well, what about a real experiment? What, how would you do a real experiment? What makes a friend, you know, what, what turns something, a friend in quote marks into a real friend? 
Well, there are lots of different answers to that. So, so you might say, well, what if we just get to much larger or more complex quantum system? And I think that's definitely an interesting direction, uh, but it's hard to know when you would ever meet a threshold where someone would say, okay, that's large enough, or okay, that's complex enough. Uh, like it's not clear when, when you would ever get, get to that point just by going the route of making it large or complex. Um, something that people might be thinking of is, well, don't we have a definition of what an observation is from Bohr, although it's actually what Wheeler said that Bohr meant, anyway, uh, of, of a, an observation being an irreversible act of amplification. Um, well, that's, you could have that concept of what a real observation is, uh, but if you do have that, then by definition, we can't go into the lab and violate the local friendliness inequalities because the whole the whole setup requires the measurements by the friends to be or to be reversed logically reversed um, and if it is if if you say that it has to be an irreversible act of amplification then there's just no way they can be reversed so you would never by definition be able to see a violation of a local friendliness inequality uh, with that concept so, so where does that lead, leave us? Well, I think the most promising direction is to go back with what Wigner originally said uh, of a sentient being with the same types of impressions and sensations as I. Okay. Um, so how could we possibly do that? Um, and the answer is, well, not with a human. Um, we need a sentient being, a sentient observer, uh, who can be unitary or reverse. And my answer would be, what we need is an artificial intelligence running on an enormous fault tolerant quantum computer. Okay. And so this is why, this is why we need a quantum computer. <laughs> um, okay, so then this, this gets us into now the, the, um, the last part, the in preparation. So this is something which we mentioned in the nature physics paper, but didn't really go into details. And it's now what we're exploring in great detail in, in this, uh, this paper in preparation, uh, which I'm calling a thoughtful local friendliness logo theorem. Okay, so yeah, so there we go, there, there's, there it is again. Um, so, okay, what are we talking about in terms of an experiment here? I'm gonna start with the experiment and then I'm gonna present the, the new theorem, uh, the new new theorem. <laughs> um, so, so you said, well, how, how could we, yes, how could we simulate, or well, we shouldn't say simulate, how, how can we run an artificial intelligence on a quantum computer? Well, we could just say, well, we know that artificial intelligence is possible because we can simulate physical systems on computers and therefore we just need to simulate a brain or something like that um, or maybe even a brain in the body and a bit of environment okay um, and if you do that well it's probably I mean these are I think way underestimates um, but yeah you're going to have some enormous number of computers it's probably way way like orders of magnitude um, bigger than these these rough bounds that I've given here. So that that's extremely challenging. Okay, so so okay, let's see. Well, what what else might you do that might be a little bit easier? Um, and the answer I think would be well, if we have human level artificial intelligence programs, which it looks like we're heading towards, you know, reasonably fast at the moment, um, then you could probably simulate that with a, a lot fewer. So still a very large number of qubits, but but you know something which is not quite as uh, unimaginable. Um, and so then, yeah, so then we have to imagine we actually have an artificial intelligence algorithm running on a quantum computer. Uh, let's call the artificial intelligence Charlie. Uh, we would be able to talk to Charlie, get to know Charlie, be, um, be convinced, you know, actually become friends with Charlie, okay? Uh, and then once we had established that relationship, then we can do an experiment. But I won't say an experiment on Charlie, I'll say an experiment with Charlie. Okay, so Charlie is would have to presumably agree. So I'm jumping ahead. Would have to agree to be part of this experiment, um, and and moreover, like the ethical the ethics committee would have to say, yes, it's okay to do this experiment um, with Charlie. Now, why might Charlie be you know have have been taught to thoughts about doing an experiment like this? Uh, because the experiment is going to involve this time in which Charlie is completely isolated from the outside world. That bit's not too too um, scary. Um, but more than that, then Charlie is also going to sometimes when we run the experiment, uh, have his evolution reversed. 
so he's going to lose roughly a second of his experiential time um, because we're going to reverse the evolution on the quantum computer and go back to the point before he made a measurement on his qubit. Okay, so here's, here's a picture showing how this is actually uh, working. Uh, so again, this is a space-time diagram. It turns out technically that we only need one enormous quantum computer. We don't need Charlie and Adebi. So there we go. We've saved a huge amount of money already by being clever. Um, the, we can still derive the inequalities with just one uh, friend. Okay, so we just have three parties now, Alice, Charlie, and Bob. Uh, Bob is a lot further away than this diagram shows, and that's what this wiggly line here is meant to represent. Uh, these dotted lines are, are, are light cones now. So this is, uh, yeah, so they're not 45 degrees anymore. They're much flatter So because we have a lot of stuff which we want to fit in here. Okay, so uh, yes, we've got Charlie, we've got, yeah, so Charlie and Bob now are going to share this single state. The, here in pink. Uh, Charlie is going to observe his qubit in the Z basis, say. And yeah, and once he's observed it, he's going to think about it. So this observation is just all described by unitary evolution happening uh, for the quantum computer. So he's going to process this in input qubit exactly the same as he would process any bit input that he is going to be given and asked to, you know, here's a bit of information, think about it, you know, and then think about a message that you're going to send to Alice to let Alice know what you've seen. Okay, so that's this message M here, which is being communicated to Alice. So all of this is described by a unitary, right, including the sending the message. Um, then what happens next depends on what Alice's setting was here, back here, at point X. Uh, so if X equals one, what she does as before is just read the message. Okay, so she just finds out what it is that Charlie saw. Uh, she, she deduces C and then she just sets her own outcome equal to whatever it is that Charlie saw. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, if X is not one, so in this case, we the simplest thing, the only thing we need is X in the two settings, so X equals two. Uh, then what she does is um, before the message arrives, she sends a control signal to the hardware of the quantum computer telling it to now reverse for the next t seconds whereas t is order one right um, then when the message arrives instead of reading it she just immediately sends it back through the same quantum channel that it arrived in uh, so now this and in reverse order if it's multiple bit multiple qubits long in reverse order so it arrives back at uh, Charlie's computer at exactly the right time to go back into this reverse unitary algorithm uh, so that the whole thing can be reversed and at this end of time here uh, it's in exactly the same state that it was at this point here. Okay and then Alice also sends a message to Charlie at this point say oh okay don't measure the qubit uh, this this time, I mean, uh, don't measure the qubit, uh, Charlie, um, just send it to me, okay? And so that's what he does. He just sends a qubit to Alice and, and Alice then measures it in whatever, yeah, in, in some other basis, say the X basis. Uh, it is important that it's a different basis from the one that Charlie used. Uh, and then she records that result, okay? Uh, meanwhile, on, on the other side, yeah, Bob is measuring in yet another couple of bases, um, between X and Y. Uh, and then over many runs, we can look at um, this probability distribution of P of A and B given X, Y. Uh, and it turns out in this case uh, that violating a local friendliness, violating a local friendliness inequality is mathematically the same as just violating the CHSH inequality. So we can just do it with the, the same, the usual CHSH. So if we violate, if these inequalities violate the CHSH inequality, then that means that the assumptions of local friendliness has been uh, violated um, and, and that's all great. Okay, so, and, and I think the argument is, well, that's an actual uh, more convincing experiment, uh, but we wanna do more than this in the paper. We don't just wanna propose a more convincing experiment. We also wanna formulate the theorem uh, in a way that makes the, the like what the implications of the ex ex experiment are to be as, um, I was going to say thought provoking, um,
but yeah, no pun intended to be to be as uh, yeah uh, confronting as possible. Okay, so so the idea uh, we want to do is to formulate the new theorem in terms of a larger number of assumptions, um, and we'll see what. Well, partly yeah, it's just I th I think uh, useful to break things down, but the particular reason that it's useful we'll see in a minute. Okay, so here, here is the theorem now with six assumptions. Four of them are metaphysical, two of them are technological, if you like. Okay. Um, so local agency here again, the same as before. Okay. Um, now we get into uh, uh, other things which do look really metaphysical. So the first one is physicalism. Pardon me. Uh, so yeah, so this is a thoughtful local friendliness theorem. So we're going to formulate these things in terms of thought. So physicalism is the idea that any thought supervenes upon a physical process in time uh, and in the space of the brain or other information processing unit that is having the thought. Okay. Three. So the idea is that all of these assumptions are supposed to be as plausible as possible. So most scientists would just say yes. Physicalism is true. Uh, three, ego absolutism. This is a new, yeah, a new term that um, we've invented. My communicable thoughts are absolutely real. Okay, so this is deliberately phrased in the first person. So when you look at this assumption and say, "Do I agree?" You know, do do I believe that assumption? You obviously don't interpret it as you know. It, uh, are Howard's communicable thoughts absolutely real? You you ask the question of yourself. Do you think that the thoughts you have are absolutely real? We and you don't have to qualify, you know, their reality in any way. It's like a cogito ergo sum sort of idea. Okay. Um, Fourth, we have an actual assumption called friendliness, okay, which is nice for calling it a local friendliness uh, theorem. So friendliness is, is if by open-ended communication, uh, an independent party displays cognitive ability, at least on par with my own, then they have thoughts and any thought they communicate is as real as any communicable thought of my own. Okay, so again, phrased in the first person, you have to assess whether you believe this yourself. Are you, do you adopt a friendly attitude towards other uh, parties or potential parties who display cognitive ability on par with your own? So this doesn't mean, so yeah, it's a stress. As real as doesn't, it's not building in that it has to be absolutely real, right? But if you believe that your own thoughts are absolutely real and you uh, believe in friendliness, then you would also be attributing absolute reality to the friends of other parties who seem to be cognitively equal to, to yourself. Okay. All right. Then the, the technological assumptions. Are, uh, so one, uh, oh, well, yeah, five as it appears here, um, human level artificial intelligence is possible. Uh, I don't think, I think that's still an open question, um, but most people would think that it is. And then six, uh, universal quantum computing can be done uh, very large scale and very fast. <clears throat> Again, this doesn't actually assume that the quantum theory is the correct theory. It just says, well, it's close enough that we can do universal quantum computing. Okay. Um, Right, so so yeah, so what I like about these assumptions is that I think each of them individually seems very plausible, but what we can say is putting them together uh, is we get a contradiction. So yeah, so in case it's not obvious, so assumptions one, two, three, and four uh, put together is essentially the same as the local friendliness assumption uh, that we had before, but now broken down. Uh, and then these other ones are, are breaking the superpowers up into, Okay, this is actually, you know, this is actually realistic. Okay, it's not possible current experimentally experiments, but it's not just some magic hypothetical thing we're talking about. These are real technological assumptions that are going to be relevant at some point uh, this century, probably. Okay, but the other reason I like these these particular assumptions is that we can compare them to what different interpretations or modifications of quantum theory. Uh, says, and we can actually find uh, six 
classes, if you like, of interpretations or modifications of quantum theory, uh, each of which the way they deal with the theorem is to deny, obviously, a different one of those six assumptions. So, for example, with deterministic hidden variable theories, um, they, they, are, they are compatible with the theory, be, the theorem, sorry, I should say, because they say the local agency is false. Okay. Um, uh, I won't go through all of these, uh, so, but um, a de broad class of interpretations, which we call relativist, uh, or which embrace relativism, like the Everett's relative state interpretation or cubism, uh, are actually going to reject ego absolutism. So they would begin by saying, yeah, no, I'm not committed to even my own thoughts being absolutely real. Um, yeah, moving on to modifications. Um, so yeah, no, maybe, yes. This, so some of these are subtle, but we have obviously thought them through carefully. Spontaneous collapse theories, and so then actually end up denying friendliness. So if you think, yeah, if you're fond of spontaneous collapse, then that's an implication of that. You have to, in fact, say, no, I'm not friendly uh, in that technical sense. Um, and then we get into even weirder uh, ideas like uh, by Penrose and Chalmers, uh, which interestingly have these technological uh, implications. So Penrose seems to think that human level artificial intelligence is just impossible. Uh, and, and some ideas about thoughts leading to collapse of the wave function, we actually say that universal quantum computing is not possible. Uh, and I, yeah, I, that's, that's, you could say that these are unlikely, but I think definitely it's a motivation for, for testing because I don't think we can rule it out a priori. Um, okay, so yes, I, obviously I could spend forever on this slide approximately, um, but time is running out, so I will go to my conclusion. Um, so the take home messages, uh, so to begin with the, the overall idea of, of metaphysical, uh, experimental metaphysics is the idea that metaphysical, metaphysical assumptions that individually are not testable can have falsifiable empirical consequences in conjunction. And that's really how all of the, the things in this field work. Okay. Uh, more of we can say in the case of Bell's theorem that these are actually falsified empirical consequences now. Okay. Um, and what I'm claiming is that continued advances in artificial intelligence and quantum computing uh, is going to open a new frontier in experimental metaphysics. Uh, and specifically that we could rule out these now experimental metaphysical <laughs> assumptions, uh, sorry, just metaphysical, these metaphysical assumptions, uh, which I've changed the order of yet again, sorry, um, but here we go, uh, physicalism, uh, any thought supervenes upon a physical process, the short version, ego absolutism, my communicable thoughts are absolutely real, uh, friendliness, if a party displays cognitive ability on par with my own, then any thoughts they communicate Oops, it should be R uh, as real as my own. And then local agency as before. Any intervention X is uncorrelated with any set of relevant physical events outside X's future light frame. Um, and yes, I, I talked briefly about the proof of principle experiment, but just to say that that's just the, the very first baby step towards a, a real experiment in this area. And with that, um, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Howard, for a very interesting talk. Uh, we've had a very lively uh, chat discussion going on while you're uh, talking. Oh, um, wow, I see, yeah. Am I supposed maybe, to be? No, 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 no. I, I oh, wanted yeah. to have you finish the talk and we can have discussion yeah. afterwards. I, I will say that I have tried to make friends with my computer, but despite <laughs> my best efforts, there's just no spark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bad chemistry, I guess. It's bad, yeah, I guess so. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, this is. Uh, so, so, so let's uh, let's go to the chat. I think Justin kicked this off, so maybe we can we can turn it over to Justin to to give us some questions and or or, or thoughts. Sure. <clears throat> yeah. First of all, great talk, Howard. Thanks, it's Justin. Nice to see you semi in person. For yeah, change. it is. It is. Yes, and as opposed to just on Facebook. <laughs> 
Um, so yeah, while you were talking kind of in the middle of this, uh, I was just thinking about your definition of friend and your introduction of um, essentially consciousness in the middle of saying there has to be some human level intelligence involved in order for you to consider it. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we important. we don't quite go, yeah, we try to actually avoid the word consciousness because that's probably or sentience or, or yeah, or sensations or whatever, because that seems to be, yeah, people are probably less likely to uh, be comfortable with thinking about that in terms of a digital computer. Uh, so we try right. to just stick to thoughts, but yes, it's the, it's it's a fine distinction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my my immediate thought was, it's not clear to me why you need to go to that extreme where you need to invoke a, a simulable intelligence of some sort. It seems like um, it might be sufficient to just simulate a measuring device of some sort that people would normally consider to be here's a classical measuring device, but that's still modeled as a quantum system that can be reversed by unitaries. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess the thing is that there, what's, yeah, so this, I think is relevant to this slide. So the question is, well, what makes something a measurement device? I mean, some, right. like there, there's another experimental group, we did an experiment based on Bruckner's theorem. Um, um, so yeah, we don't think that was nearly as an interesting theorem, but nevertheless, they did, they, they actually did a more difficult experiment. Uh, they had an independent qubit as their uh, friend. Um, and so in some, that their attitude actually was, well, we, we have done the experiment, right? That a, we've, we've measured one qubit with the second qubit. Uh, the second qubit is a measuring device. Th that's all, that's all there is to do, right? What else do you want? You know, it, it carries enough information. Why, why would you need anything to call it a, a measurement device? Um, and so I think that's, that's the problem with that approach is that we don't have any threshold to say, you know, for someone to say, oh, that can't be a measuring device. It's too, too um, small or not right. classical right. enough. I mean, so if you say it's too small, well, then the question is, well, how right. big does it have to be? And if you say it's yeah, not I, classical I, enough, I, then what do you mean by classical? Because like, I think actually a lot of our intuitions about classical are related to, to irreversibility and clearly we can't, you know, have that. Yeah. Right. So I, I think um, the way I would respond to that question of like, where is that threshold in the case of simulating a measurement device as by invoking Heisenberg's cut uh, in an unusual way is that usually what we do is we say when we, we model a, a detector, we still have to have another step where the detector is read by an experimenter. And you can keep adding layers. We have to keep modeling the next layer of interaction of the measurement yes. up until mm -hmm. some point where you say, if I add another layer, it negligibly changes the results. And so you can just say at that point, if I make it any bigger, it will neg negligibly change the results. Uh, I'll declare it to be a classical measuring device. Yeah, it's not. I'm not sure what you mean by results, because in in the sense, like just one, like one qubit is big enough to contain the information. I mean, I, yeah, I don't even. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not sure what you would mean by. Yeah, I just don't just don't know what you mean by changing the results. What I mean is that normally when you model like a detector as a quantum system, there's still mm. a step somewhere where you have to measure the detector. And say, well, the detector reports yeah. this result when I look right. at it. But if I add a not, yeah, if I add a third qubit which measures the second qubit. Right. But the idea is the, that an actual measuring device in the lab is something like a, a, a cascade photodiode. Yeah. Where there's just so much happening in a short amount of time that you could try modeling all of that. And at some point you'd see that adding those extra systems won't actually change anything. Yeah, so I, I that guess maybe I, that's a, a, a yeah. tangible criterion. I don't know. I, I guess I just don't see that adding anything is really going to change anything. Like if you if you if all the information is stored in a you know a, a single qubit, then it's yeah, it's not clear to me that I mean I think that saying is that where you can put yeah, I mean I, I thought the point of the Heisenberg cut was that essentially you can put the cut anyway. Um well, and you, so it's you, not you clear to me anywhere. that you there's there's a too small scale where beneath that you get a wrong answer so <laughs> there's a minimum size but, okay but yeah, i guess so, I, yeah okay so i guess i'm just yeah maybe the, yeah this is too complex to try to sort out now but i mean that that's an interesting idea but it's not clear to me what yeah what exactly what your proposal is but but there's something maybe we should talk about offline 
Yeah, yeah. But so that, that, that issue aside, just my, my main question was why the impulse to go all the way to simulating an intelligence rather than some sort of midpoint between there? like the, a measuring device um, defining um, better what yeah. this classical boundary is or something like that. But you're cho yeah. choosing intelligence yeah. specifically as that boundary. Okay. I, I mean, so I think we, after we finish this paper, we will probably write another paper about, uh, okay, like that's the long-term vision, but what, what, what's a plausible path towards it? But I think I, like, I at least really want to set out uh, a, an ultimate goal of, of saying, like, yeah, not, not saying, you know, this, yeah, basic, basically an ultimate goal to say, what is the most convincing experiment that you could do along these lines? And, and is it feasible? And so that's what we, and that's what this paper is partly about. It's partly about the, the new theorem, the new metaphysical way of thinking about it, but it's also about um, the experiment and Eleanor uh, has been, you know, working on, um, yeah, like what are the actual resources that you might need to do this as an experiment, and of course, it's yeah, it's 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 extremely scary, but um, but as I said, like I don't certainly not inconceivable this century. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just think I just think that is the most yeah. Is that this would be you you? It's good to start with something where everyone would could say, you know, yes, that's the most. I mean, that's yeah, that's a real experiment. That's a real Wigner's friend experiment to the extent that it's possible to do that at all. And then we can argue about, okay, how, what if you scale back here and here and here and here and here, when are you going to still be satisfied? So, okay, okay. let right. me go to the next question. So Howard, there were a lot of sort of philosophical leaps in your talk. So I want to go to Kelvin to give us some philosophical questioning. <laughs> um, sure. So I guess this is quite philosophical because I didn't quite understand the distinction you were making between metaphysical assumptions and non-metaphysical assumptions. Mm -hmm. so as I was listening to the talk, it sort of occurred to me that there's an additional assumption that you need, which is that the process by which an observation happens is not, uh, sorry, is reversible. You need that for the, for the setup of the experiment. And then you mentioned that yourself, although you didn't quite elevate it to an assumption, but then you, at the end, you, you had something similar, um, which is you were phrasing it in terms of the possibility of universal quantum computing. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is fair enough. That's perhaps a, a way of thinking about it. But then you said, oh, that has a different status. That has a non-metaphysical status. Mm -hmm. So that's different than metaphysical ones. But I guess I just don't see the difference because the reason why it's non-metaphysical is because we can test it. Yes. Um, and then the metaphysical ones, we can't. But all of those seem testable to me. So take physicalism, for example, the main reason why most philosophers of mind are now physicalists is on the basis of empirical evidence, right? On the basis of the neural correlates of consciousness for each consciousness. Right, but then you're assuming that, that, that you're associating a thought with a brain. And the whole point of this is that we're talking about thoughts on a quantum computer. So there are no neural <laughs> correlates of thoughts. Right, because there are no neurons. Um, Sorry, can I replace the phrase neural correlate of consciousness with physical correlate of consciousness? Uh, yes, but we still have, right, I mean, the essential, uh, I mean, maybe to be, to be really, yeah, go back to the one, uh, it's going to take forever, um, but I like this picture, so I want to show it again anyway, um, just to be cute about it. Right, here we go. So, so. So here we have a quantum computer in a superposition of two completely different thought processes. So the question is, so is there a, you know, a physical correlate of thought there? Well, certain theories of consciousness will say yes. Exactly, the theories, moment, theories, so. theories. That's the point. That's why it's, an, it's a metaphysical assumption because you can't answer that question without talking about theories. So okay. it's not an it's not an empirical question. Yeah. Maybe I mean just very briefly as an example, the integrated information theory of consciousness. Yeah. Will no, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So you you will you will. I would argue that is testable. That theory. Well, okay. That theory. Yeah. Okay. I'll come back to it. So that theory gives you a definite answer to the question. Yeah. And is that theory testable? So I should. Yeah. So so given that you're in the audience, which I didn't know. I mean, yeah, so now it's, I feel bad that, that I mean, I only had room to include uh, Chalmers in there, but of course I know that you and, and David Chalmers 
uh, have done the most recent work on actually cashing out this idea very specifically um, of, right, that, that, that integrated information theory could actually lead to collapse of the wave function. Okay, but that's a different thing. I mean, that's actually then, um, so that has empirical consequences because it would mean that universal quantum computing is not possible. Okay, and so so I, I would agree that that's, that's testable. Um, well, yeah, no, I think that's just totally consistent with what I said. I mean, but I, I think that, yeah, I think, yeah, I think you are thinking about it the wrong way and thinking that physicalism is being tested there. No, what's actually being tested is to show that universal quantum computing is not possible. If, if the theory about integration in like sufficiently large integrated information causing collapse of the wave function is correct, then universal quantum computing is not possible. Which yeah, I think I, is mean, I was thinking IoT by itself is experimentally testable, but I, I think this is a difficult issue. So I'm happy to uh, pass it on to Matt. Uh, I think has the next question. Okay. Yeah, I think Matt Matt is next uh, with a hand up. Oh. Hi, Howard. Hi, Matt. Um, let me just ask a quick a quick question before I get into anything. I just wanted to know if there's any significance to whether the wise and ends are capital or lowercase in this slide. Ah, uh, yeah, yes, there is. Um, so, so I guess it's that most most theories of physics don't have any particular commitment to saying that these things are possible. Uh, so the small whys here just mean to say that okay, the, the well, the theories don't commit one to believing these things, but most adherents of those uh, are going to say, oh, yeah, I've no reason to believe that that's impossible. And so that's why it's the small y. Yep. Um, uh, and there's also a little small n here, which which is a interesting little thing, which we could. But it's yeah, that's fairly technical. But yeah, <laughs> just to flag that it is there. Yes. Okay. Um, well, I mean, I could follow up on either what Kelvin or Justin said, but let me follow up on, on Kelvin a little bit. I mean, I think it's uh, like to my mind. There isn't a distinction between metaphysical assumptions and non-metaphysical assumptions. I mean, maybe there's a sort of sliding scale or something like that, because um, you know, any physical assumption, anything that you call an empirical assumption, you know, we know, um, uh, or you know, all empirical theories are, or every 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 experiment is theory laden, right? So uh, there is no no prediction that you can test without uh making a ton of theoretical assumptions well the i same, i don't know at the, I mean... at the same time like i think let me just say i think mm. Adam Shimony was absolutely wrong to call bell's theorem experimental metaphysics oh really what he, should have, what he should have said is there's a bunch of stuff that you guys have been calling metaphysics which we have just discovered is physics right it's, it's, it's ordinary conventional physics. There's, there's a set of assumptions, there's a theorem, there's, a, there's an experiment, yeah. and yeah. the experiment starts one way or the other. So I, I, I think that what you know, Bell's theorem shows and these kind of theorems shows is not that there's experimental metaphysics, but it's just that there are things which we previously thought were metaphysics, which are just ordinary, actually ordinary physics. I, I would tend to disagree but, but, okay, but this is obviously a, I, yeah, we shouldn't get into that discussion here, I don't think. Yeah, probably not. Um, oh, was that, was, did, that was, that was, yeah, so that was the main, yeah, you didn't have any other? Well, I, I mean, I can also follow up on what Justin said. I mean, this is in the chat room a bit as well. I, I think right. what's necessarily the case in the, in these Vigna type experiments is, you know, when you talk about Heisenberg cuts, uh, in the conventional account, there's you, you can move it. There's obviously a lowest place you can put it. If you put it below that, then you'll get the predictions wrong, right? Because mm, you, you mm. your coherence set at a higher level. There's a highest level as well, which is that you know, all, if I'm an observer and I see definite things, I have to, when I'm describing my own experiments, put the Heisenberg cut in front of my face, right? Um, and normally, uh, in normal experiments you can find a place to put the Heisenberg cut that every observer involved in the experiment would agree is an okay place to put the Heisenberg cut. Right. What's necessarily true in these Wigner-Friend experiments is that you have observers 
you have what I what I would call a level conflict. You know, you have uh, so Charlie says, okay, the Heisenberg cut can be between here and here, and somebody else mm. says, no, it has to be between here and here. Mm. So there is no place yeah. in which all observers yeah. involved in the experiment yeah. can agree to put the Heisenberg cut. Yeah. That's why it doesn't make sense to to say, you know, we do something that we would conventionally uh, put the Heisenberg cut in front of, because there yeah. will be some some observer involved in the in the experiment who who necessarily disagrees with with that placement. Yes, but, yes, I would I would agree with that. Um, yeah, and and if you mean by the Heisenberg cut to, to say that uh, you know it's it's valid, right? We know that this is a good enough place to put it because if we actually go in and I don't know how, but uh, decohere things at that point and make things truly classical, it will make no difference, then yes, we absolutely cannot do that at any point in this experiment involving the, the observations of Charlie and Debbie. Yeah. yeah. Because they have to remain in superposition. That is the whole point. Yeah. Yeah. OK, I think uh, oh, now we have Eric. Uh, welcome, Eric. You have oh. your hand up and you were lively in the chat, so maybe you can uh, echo some of the things you were bringing up. Um, well, I think the discussions in the chat have probably been discussed sufficiently. I just wanted to add another comment on the discussion about metaphysics, although um, how it was, uh, to not to, to comment more, but I just want to add one, well, my thoughts on that and what uh, is I, th I, I mean by metaphysics in that sense. And I think of it as essentially uh, similar to the notion of metamathematics, which is widely used in the foundations of mathematics refers to the field that includes uh, Gator's theorem, which is a field of study which has mathematical theories themselves as the object of study rather than a mathematical theory in itself. So, so I think experimental metaphysics in this case is it's, it's because the object of studies are physical theories. Right. When you're doing physics, what you're trying is to come up with a theory to describe the world, whereas here we are describing properties of theories. And it does turn out that um, each of those properties taken individually do not have any, by themselves, do not have any empirical implications in the sense that uh, for the, at least for the, as far as I know, for what uh, observations are possible in the world according to our best theories, there are theories which violate or satisfy each one of those assumptions. But taken together, they have empirical consequences. And that's why it's experimental metaphysics in that sense, metaphysics in the sense of being about physics, about physical theories and experimental because we find that some conjunctions of assumptions about the properties of physical theories can have empirical consequences when taken together, even though they might not have consequences taken by themselves. Yeah. So yeah, I that so I'm in accord with Eric. And yeah, so in a sense, it's experimental physics because if you like, the physics is this column here. Here are here are all sorts of you know particular theories, some of them actually empirically different from quantum theory, some of them just interpretations. But you know, we're not in the business of coming up with new theories. Uh, what we're saying is here are assumptions that constrain all possible theories. And, and we can say, okay, and then so how does that work with particular theories? And so I say this is doing metaphysics. Yeah. And 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 well, we can't actually say for sure that these constraints hold until we actually do the experiment and, and know, for example, that these, these bits do work, um, that, that that's when these metaphysical assumptions come into play. And therefore what we're doing is experimental metaphysics. I mean, at the moment we're doing design or design of experimental metaphysics because the experiments are many decades away, but, but yeah, yeah. So I think we agree, yeah. All right, so, so we're, we're, we're past our time now, but, but I think the discussion is very interesting. So if you have to go, just go. We'll just continue to have questions. Uh, so why don't we go to uh, Kai? I think you're next. All right, so, um, you know, I work on local many world stuff, and so I'm going to ask you a question that pertains really just generally to many worlds. Mm -hmm. um, talking about Charlie and or, or just the friend in the lab um, being in a, in a superposition, but also at the same time having experienced an outcome. So Charlie is there in the quantum computer in a superposition of both outcomes. And so how can I look at the state of Charlie and determine which outcome it was? It seems like we're, we're, we're definitely talking about two Charlies having experienced two different outcomes and then they get erased. So what do you think about that? Uh, well, that would be the many standard many worlds um, 
response. But how, are you, yes. how are you getting away from it? I mean, it seems like that is what you are saying in your theory. That your theory. Oh, no, no, that. no. We're just saying that's like that's the quantum description, right? But we're not. But we are not making any mapping from. Yeah, we're not. We're not assuming that just because Charlie is in superposition, that doesn't mean that Charlie's thoughts are in superposition. So, for example, what are some other alternatives? Well, one is, well, okay, that's a complicated one because, uh, yeah, well, uh, <laughs> which should we go with one? Um, okay, so so in, in the spontaneous collapse theories, for example, we just say that, that, that there, are, there is no physical, there is nothing physical happening uh, in the quantum computer at all. So there are no thoughts happening because there is just no physical things happening there which relate to the logical state of the quantum computer, for example. So that I'm would not, be... I'm not sure I follow what the, how that relates to what I was asking. Um, like well, you were just saying that, that you, you were saying that it must be that, well, no, Charlie, so the, that Charlie is in a superposition of having two different thoughts. Yeah. And well, we're so saying, the, no, that, that totally depends on your interpretation of, of quantum theory, for example. Right, but what I'm saying is the premise of reversibility requires both terms in that superposition to be there. And it requires got, that quantum state to exist. Yeah, right. yeah, it requires that quantum state to be like that. that. State, what, is, what is the premise on which you can claim there was an outcome or one outcome versus the other outcome? Okay, so another possibility is that we have a, a deterministic hidden mm -hmm. variable theory, or it doesn't have to be deterministic. We have some hidden variable theory such that one of those branches of the wave function has associated with it uh, a reality and the other one does not. So that's another and yes, still, but But still the, the operation that we would call the unitary reversal will nevertheless return it to its prior state. Correct. Okay. All right, uh, Indrajit. Hey, hi, uh, Albert first for the hi. talk. Yep. And I had a, a question about the deterministic hidden variable um, field here in this table. It seems to me that um, this this row should be further like segregated into deterministic and then super deterministic. It's not clear to me that- Oh yeah, 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 no. Um, well, actually, I don't know. I mean, so yeah, so we just, I, I didn't claim that these were all of the interpretations. Um, these were just illustrative in, in yeah, an illustrative set to indicate the usefulness of this way of constructing the theorem. So, so yeah. yes, but I don't know whether actually super deterministic would make any difference. I think it would actually look the same, but go on, make your comment, yeah. So uh, for example, in pilot wave theory, like the experiment uh, choices are completely determined, but they are not um, correlated with the relevant physical factors that determine the measurement outcomes. Whereas they have to be sure. in a super deterministic theory. Now, yes. if the experimenter is entangled with the physical, uh, with, with let's say a system which is leading to, um, which is determining the quantum uh, experimental outcome, then we would have a violation of local agency in that scenario. So I, I would think that it is a small n in pilot wave theory, whereas it would be a big n. Oh, no, no, no. So, so pilot wave theory violates, definitely violates local agency just because, I mean, deterministic hidden variable theories have to be non-local in some sense. And specifically, they, they actually have to violate local, local agency. So, so, just, so, so this, this violation is there for the same reason that in uh, Bell's theorem, uh, when you have predetermined, so, so deterministic hidden variable theories satisfy predetermination. Uh, and so they have to violate, yeah, either look and, and they satisfy, yeah, absoluteness of observed events. Um, so they have to, to violate local agency. So, so yeah, so both the super deterministic versions and the deterministic versions will violate local agency. Now you might say, you know, oh, well, you should split this up into different assumptions so that we clearly see the difference between super deterministic and deterministic. But as you know, right, um, this is actually not a trivial thing to do. And this is, this is another of the projects that I'm working on with Eric uh, and, and another collaborator. So, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. So Howard, I, I had a question about uh, this issue of thoughts you brought up. Can you go to your picture of, of showing your, 
your your the, thoughtful the quantum computer. Yeah, this yeah, one like this one. Yeah, mm -hmm. Charlie. The, now, now you seem to distinguish this notion of thought from quantum states. So the idea is that Charlie has thoughts, but it's not necessarily the same as the as the quantum states. Or do you or do you identify the two? No. So it's it's not it it's a um. So we are saying that if uh, the reason we're attributing thoughts to Charlie is just because this is in the context that, you know, there has been previous interaction between Alice and Bob and Charlie, say, and Charlie seems like an intelligent fellow. Uh, he seems to give thoughtful answers to questions about all sorts of uh, topics. Uh, there doesn't seem to, and he's able to communicate those thoughts as he does in this case here. So if one adopts the friendly attitude, then there is no reason not to you know ascribe him thoughts in the context of this experiment as well so we're not saying that there are thoughts because they yeah because the when we calculate the quantum state we can see that there are thoughts uh it, it's more that well just charlie is part of this experiment is a party in this experiment we are going to treat him the same as we would treat any other party um and and that is that if he if he promises to make you know to observe the quantum system and then think about the result and then tell us what he saw like well that then we're just going to accept that that means that there are there are thoughts there that's a purely metaphysical assumption yeah so, so I, I think that is important like describe the thoughts with the quantum state or something like that you're this is something additional no. to the to the quantum yeah. description of charlie this is your idea Yes, that that's right. So, so I mean, I, I think the idea, yes. So, which I think underlines why it makes sense to call these metaphysical assumptions, because it's not based on any physical theory that tells us that there should be thoughts there. It's okay. just if you adopt these attitudes towards, like, if you can talk to someone and they seem to be as intelligent as you are and as thoughtful as you are, then you know, if you're friendly, you're going to attribute thoughts to them. Uh, and so, so the things like Alice, Bob and Charlie can do this experiment without knowing, in principle, without knowing anything about quantum mechanics, right? It's nothing about the quantum description that Alice writes down for Charlie or anything like that. It's like none of them need to know anything about, in principle, none of them need to know anything about quantum mechanics. Um, but what we know is that there has to be some clever engineer in the background who can build a quantum computer right, that will do all of this stuff. Uh, but none of the parties involved in the experiment have to know anything about that. Yeah, and so the, it seems like the critical I th point here is that you can have this unitary interaction and then reverse the unitary action, but maintain a memory of what happened in the intermediate uh, uh, events. Is that right? Uh, so that no memory of C ever survives. I mean, that, that is having a thought or a thought about what happened uh, and what's going on. Um, OK, so, so this, this, sorry, just, just a second. Wrapping up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to have to go in, in quite soon. Um, so yeah, so I so no, yeah, it's difficult to say what happens here, except we can say that at the end of this all, uh, we're back to the same state at this point here as we were here. Uh, at least this is what this is what if, if quantum theory is correct that in terms of the physical state, we're back to the same state here as we were before. So so I know this sort of mixes, yeah, this diagram mixes um, well, no, I, I, yeah, it, it, mis, it mixes physics and metaphysics. I guess the only thing that's metaphysics is really this thought, right? The fact that we're attributing this thought. Right, here. exactly. Everything else in this diagram is physics, okay? We, we could say, like, um, it's just, yeah, physical information flowing flowing here and there. So if we don't attribute a thought at this point here, then there there is no theorem, right? There's just like, well, this is just all some complicated uh, right. Quantum, quantum operation, which achieves nothing in particular, uh, just some very complicated way of doing Bell's theorem. So it's purely the metaphysical assumption that there really was an experience or thought of Charlie at this point that leads to, to saying that this is actually an interesting experiment to do. Yeah, where well, I guess the usual quantum point of view, would you say, is if you had some kind of memory, right, some kind of record, the point in, from the physical point of view, the record is must be erased by, by the inverse unitary operation. That's right. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 
Yep. All right. Uh, I think, uh, Eric, you want to give us a final thought and then we'll shut it down? Oh, I just wanted to maybe um, um, add something to what, what Howard has said, that, which I'm sure he will agree, that if we don't attribute a thought to what is happening at that location space time that is labeled by C, then it, there's two theories, just that then in that case, you are, someone who does that is rejecting the assumption of friendliness. Uh, sure. I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I, um, yeah, there's, there's still a theorem. It would say that you would, yes, if you have, if you, if you say that there isn't a thought there, then you're rejecting friendliness. That's right. Yes. That seems a very unfriendly way to think to say though. That's yeah. Nice. Well, this is why I, so <laughs> it, it, it's deliberately designed so that, so you that there's no easy the language way out. In your favor, your metaphysical exactly. Metaphysical <laughs> on one side of the balance there. Yeah. 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 Well, that's <laughs> right. We want, we want to, we want to, we want to, uh, yeah. We, we want to make it as awkward as possible for these physicists ah, down here nice. have no interpretation. All right, All right let's thank Howard again for the talk. This was great. Thank you, Howard. And thank we'll, you. Thank we'll you. Assume some time in California once you're once you're trying. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. It would be great. So, Matt's already it. left, but I'll I'll say something that he has said before in reference to your your ethics of this that friends don't erase friends' memories. So oh, I'm not sure that you yeah. can barely call Charlie your friend if this is the plan for Charlie. So, wow. Well, well, yeah, Charlie would have to be totally on board with it. Consenting, yeah. yeah consenting, exactly, exactly, yeah. All right. Okay, all right, thank all you right. again. Thank you.